Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to put up a title for you. Go ahead and put that up on the overhead. Becoming an instrument for God is kind of an interesting subject. And the reason it's interesting is because a lot of times we don't realize that God wants to use us as that very tool to help others. And as we become that very tool that helps others, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this, then God, through that, helps us. Let me go back just for a moment and give you some illustrations. When I, when I use the word instrument, I'm using the word instrument because every trade has an instrument in order to complete its business. The electrician carries a bag of tools. The painter carries rollers and brushes. The doctor carries his surgical instruments and his, his, all the equipment that he uses in order to be uh, and do his job as a physician. I find oftentimes that we don't realize that the word instrument means something that God wants to use, an instrument of God. And notice how I said an instrument for God, not just of God, but an instrument for God. God wants to use each one of us. And I've said this a thousand times, but I've said it once. You're his hands, you're his arms, you're his legs, you're his heart on this earth. You are something else too. You're his mouthpiece. Most people don't hear the voice of the Lord telling them what they are, what they really are, and that's why God uses so many times preachers, doesn't he? Because you come into the house of God, you should find out who you are and what God wants for you, and it's like the voice of the Lord, and all of a sudden you sit there and you go, bang, all of a sudden something happens on the inside. And man, it just deals with your heart, and you know that you heard from God. God wants to take each one of us and use us as a tool for his praise and his glory. <clears throat> a couple of things happen. Let me give you an illustration. About, uh, about a month and a quarter ago, I was, as most of you already know, I've said this on Wednesday nights when I teach the last few Wednesday nights, that I, I was really sick in my back. I'd had back surgery. The doctor, let me just review for a moment, had x-rayed the back surgery, and it was a failed surgery. And they wanted to go in again and do another surgery and then turn me over, cut me open again, take all of my interiors out, my guts out, and approach my spine from this side. I, and again, I, I, I just won't tell you what I told the doctor. It wasn't very spiritual. <laughs> but it's, it's like, a, like, you know what, you're going to do that to me. That'll be a cold day in some place, you know. <clears throat> and I said to the doctor, I said, I cried out to God last week before I heard this news that my surgery had failed. I had finally gotten past, if you will, finally gotten past just praying and talking to God, quoting scripture to God, and I cried out to God. Something from the depths on the inside, sometimes prayer and praise and worship and magnification of who God is doesn't just come from our mouth or doesn't just come from, you know, an expression from our face, but comes from the recesses of our heart. Something deep down inside cried out like I had never heard it before in my life. It was like a little boy with tears that just jumped out of my face and it was a different thing I'd ever expressed. And from the moment I did that, God started healing me. And when I went to that doctor, I said, God is healing me. He was a Christian doctor, a good guy, wonderful doctor. He, he believes in healing and everything. And he says, sometimes, he says, I'm glad you said that. He says, I, just let me know how you're doing. I want to know on a regular basis. I'll see you in a few weeks. And a few weeks went by and I went back to see him. He said, man, he says, you're the subject of my Bible study in my house on faith and believing God, and he, he's a good guy. One of the stipulations for me is that God spoke to me. You know, when God speaks to me, he doesn't just speak to me with an audible voice. Probably none of us in here have heard that audible voice. Debbie said she heard an audible voice once in her life when she said God told her to love me. <laughs> Do you remember that, Debbie? 
Every time you're mad at me, I want to remind you that God told you to love me. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it was like an audible voice. For most of us, we don't hear that audible voice. It's just something you know that you know that you know. God said, that settles it. Somehow, maybe nothing's changed, but everything's changed. You know, God spoke to you. God said to me, he says, I want you back in the food lines, and I want you to see my poor people. I don't have a problem, and none of us have a problem here at The Rock getting into the food lines and getting into face-to-face -to -face with broken humanity. This church is notorious for that. We work hard at ministering to thousands and tens of thousands of people every month. He said to me, he says, I want you to go and stand in the food lines. And I said, God, how can I stand? I can't stand for any more then five minutes before I have to sit down. And by the way, can I just say something to you? I actually don't have to sit down. I just have learned to like it. I'm in absolutely no pain whatsoever. And, uh, but I, <clears throat> so if you think I'm sitting down here because I'm in pain, it's not true. I just have a cup of coffee and it's good. And I'm talking to you tonight from my heart. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, now watch this. So he says, I want you to go into the food line and I'm telling you the truth. I couldn't stand there for five minutes. The pain was so excruciating in my back, across my back, down my whole right side, all the way down in my foot. My foot still isn't completely recovered yet, but it's getting there, it's not any pain, but it's kind of a drop foot thing where it kind of, the nerves have been so shattered in that area, they don't do real good. And they take a while to come back, but they're coming back. And I can just say to you that that day was one of the most torturous days of my life. I, I was in such pain that I, as I was greedy, I didn't know what to do. Do I stand, here's this organized ministry that we have, and do I stand handing out food? Because they had that all covered. They have volunteers from even other churches. That They have everything there that's going on. And God said, no, I want you to stand, and as the people come in, you greet them, and as they come out of the food lines, you send them over to the vegetables and fruit and remind them of the vegetables and fruit. And don't forget to tell them they're wonderful, you're excited about seeing them, and you love them very much, and they are very precious, and we are honored at the rock to serve them. I went, So the first couple people coming, I'm telling you, I had sweat running off of me. It was a cold morning, but I was in such horrible pain. They came, and I said, good morning. They didn't look at me. I said, it's sure great to see you today. We love you a whole lot. God is in the house, and we're going to bless you real well today. You're going to leave this place. You're going to get blessed. They just kind of went right by me, head down, just, just, just beat up, totally and completely beat up. Person after person, and maybe a thousand of people, person after person, hardly looked at, I would say only two or three people even acknowledged I was there. Nobody knew who I was, by the way. These people don't go to our church, most of them, and, and they don't know who I was. And so they, 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 they I, all I did is, I love you, good morning, good to see you. <clears throat> You're special today. We're going to we bless you today. We're going to fill up your bags with groceries. And today is your day. We're, we're going to take care of you. And one would go by. They wouldn't even look, wouldn't even say anything, wouldn't even acknowledge anything. Sometimes they'd look up at me. As most of them were all broken down and coming into the food lines like this. And God would speak to me and say, how do you think they slept last night? And, and uh, God would say, you think they're hurting a little bit? You big baby, you're hurting a little bit. But look at them. They're, 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 and and you don't have to come into the food lines to get food to exist. And I, I just stopped and I realized something. I said, man, am I blessed. And the more I started realizing how blessed I was, the more I started getting free and the more I started getting healed. Sometimes we're so into our pain, into our hurt, that we forget that giving something out to someone else helps us along the road. 
The second week, it didn't change much. And then I had a couple of weeks where I was there both Tuesday and Thursday. Hopefully, I'll be there this week. It become the highlight of my life right now. I don't want to miss at least once a week just to greet the people. And by the way, after about a month and a quarter now of doing this, every person that comes in has this giant smile. And they say, and they say I love you too. Thank you. A woman came up to me last week and she says, do you know that you're the only one that tells me that I'm beautiful and told me that you love me? I haven't heard anybody say that in years. And I just held her. She's just a little broken down woman. And the tears fell down her face and fell down my face. She said, my kids are back east and nobody tells me anything like that again. And me building them up, listen to this, not only built them up, but built me up. Let me say it again. Me building them up, not only built them up, but built me up. What am I saying? I'm becoming an instrument of blessing. Blessing isn't just something said. Listen to me. Blessing is something spoken. And oftentimes we forget about that. And it's so important for us to speak the blessings to other people. It's called exhortation. Exhortation means you're taking somebody and you're speaking who they are in what God sees. You're seeing them like God sees them. You're seeing them as a child of God. You're seeing them as blessed. You're seeing them as prosperous. You're seeing them as one who has the promises of God on their side and they have completely forgotten it. And by last week, I'm telling you, the whole continents of the whole entire place was changed. In fact, some of the, our junior high and high school kids were coming out and I told their teacher, take them back and don't bring them out anymore until you teach them how to smile at these people. Because when you smile at them, guess what? It, what you give out, what you sow, you reap. And if you smile at them, all of a sudden, that smile's gonna eventually start coming back to you. And now, every time I'm in line, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you too. God bless you. Today's going to be a great day. It's going to be a blessed day, they say back to me. All of a sudden, everything that was down and out was encouraged and wonderful and up and excited and alive, all because somebody started to speak the blessings. And it's called exhortation. Sometimes we greet people, we say, hi, how are you? We never say, hey, did you know that you're blessed in the city and blessed in the field? This is going to be a great day in your life. God loves you. God's going to do something wonderful in your life. And smile at them and say, I even call them precious. Oh, you're so precious. Thank you for, I don't know everybody's name. Thank you for coming, precious. I love you. God loves you. This is going to be a great day. Oh, you got a pull cart. We're going to fill that pull cart up. Is that okay if we fill it up? And they'll say, oh, yes. And they're broken and hurting and limping. And they're down and out and they pull that pole cart by the time they leave it is filled to the top with blessings and they got a smile from, from, from one side of their face to the other it's called exhortation and it not only changed their world but it's changing my world sometimes we're so caught up in ourselves we're down, depressed, discouraged ourselves we never speak blessings over other people and the words of your mouth are so important that unless you become that instrument that God wants to use for his glory, the one who is going to be the instrument to pass along the verbal blessing. You know, when you see someone, they may not look so good in the natural, but did you know to God they're the most important people in the world? Do you know that they're blessed and God loves them and went to the cross and died for them? The king of glory whom you serve, the king of glory who we felt his presence in here tonight, the king of glory who we sang songs to and clapped our hands to, he's the same one that died for every one of those people. He thinks so much of them. They may not think much of themselves and that's our job to tell them what they should be thinking. Our job is to pass along the blessing. Is anybody listening? I found some cool scriptures, if I may share them with you tonight. Go with me to Proverbs, if you will. And when you get into Proverbs, let's take a look, because this is so important for us to start establishing in our lives. Proverbs, the 18th chapter. Will you go there with me? 
Proverbs, the 18th chapter. Let's take a look at verse number four of the 18th chapter of Proverbs. In Proverbs, the 18th chapter, verse four says it like this. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. And it's so good because an understanding of what he just said, the words of your mouth are like deep waters. What's deep waters mean? Deep waters means the water is refreshing, it's cold, yeah, it's harder to get up. But all the sediment inside the water has settled to the bottom, it's clean, and it's clear. Shallow waters are muddy, and full of dirt and sediment. But here he says your words can be like deep water. Your words to who? Not only to yourself and not only to God. See, we, uh, sometimes we focus in on uh, who we are. We focus in on saying words of great things to God, but we fail to meet each other with great words of exhortation because the words that come out of your mouth ought to be blessing words to everybody around you. I'm blessed and you're blessed and you're beautiful and you're wonderful and you're precious before God. I see you with great value. My goodness sakes, and sometimes people don't even realize what kind of great value they are. They've given up on life. Life's been difficult to them. Marriages have failed. Kids don't pay any attention to them anymore. Kids don't have anything to do with them. They think they're losers because they're broken down and out and busted and oftentimes frustrated about the things of life. And they need somebody to bring the deep, cool, refreshing words of excitement that comes from the heart of God. And when you speak blessings to other. You're not just showing blessings. You're speaking the promises, the blessings, and who they are in Christ Jesus that changes the world that you live in. Sometimes we speak good to God. Sometimes we speak good to ourselves. But have you ever thought about making it a practice to start speaking to others? It's called exhortation. When I was sick and so down and out and discouraged, I found myself incredibly frustrated. I just bored with television. I wasn't able to read my Bible and successfully concentrate like I used to. I found myself, you know, under the influence of drugs, not because uh, prescription drugs, let me make that very clear, that made me very sick and made me feel like the flu trying to get rid of the pain, which didn't do hardly anything at all. And I found something of great importance to me. I found the Word of God. I found a man's ministry. His name is Joel Osteen on the radio, on by Sirius Radio, which is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Joel Osteen, who admits he is not a teacher, but an exhorter. All he does is lift the body up. That's his job primarily. He admits it openly. Now, I think we are teachers and exhorters here at this church as a pastoral role, but he is an exhorter to the world. And I didn't have anything else to do but listen. And by the time I finished listening to him, I was shouting with praises and shouting with great things I had forgotten. And what he was doing was speaking into my life. And what you and I have got to learn is how to speak into people's lives because they need to hear your deep, cool, refreshing water of words that come out of your mouth. And that's how you become an instrument. It's so powerful while you're there in, in, in uh, Proverbs, the 12th chapter. Let's take a look at it together. Proverbs, and when you get to the 12th chapter, let's look at the 25th verse of Proverbs, the 12th chapter. We're going to look at a lot of verses tonight. I hope it doesn't bother you. I love going to the Bible. You know, whatever means you've got, you might have your iPad, you might have your phone, whatever it is that you use to get into the Word of God, let's do it. Anxious in the heart of men causes depression. Anxiety in the heart of men, anxiety. Has anybody in this room will be honest with me and tell me, what, raise your hand if you've ever had anxiety in your life. Would you, would you give that to me? Listen to what the word of God says. It will cause depression. Sometimes anxiety, not knowing where to go, what to do, what's coming up, what I'm really like, what I should be doing, what people, how things are looking, what's the truth, what's going on. Instead of something, but listen to what it goes on to say, but a good, can I ask you what's good but God? The Bible makes it very clear that there's none good but God. And he comes along and he says, but good word makes it glad. And all of a sudden makes what glad? The heart. 
I need to know all the time that I'm loved and cared for. I need to know that I'm a child of God all the time. I live in a world that's broken, don't you? I live in a world full of frustration. Listen, politics have failed for many years and you know it and so do I. They only care about exalting themselves and set no rules up all the time, which none of them work whatsoever. Can I just tell you something? Politics doesn't work, but God does work. And when you communicate the good word, it'll make their heart that used to be full of anxiety, make it absolutely filled with the goodness of God. And sometimes we just need to hear it. The other day, Debbie stopped in the middle of a sentence. I hadn't heard this in a long time. You know, I'm seven years old. And she said this in the middle. Of, I'll be 70 in August and 19th. In case you want to write me a business card, put a check in it, though. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Some of you think I'm serious. Somebody who did that one time put a check in it, didn't put it, just left a blank, but didn't sign it, so it didn't do any good. <laughs> Debbie stopped in the middle of a sentence, and she looked at me. She said, oh, my goodness, you are really handsome. I hadn't heard anybody say that in a lot of years. Man, I'm an old man. I know that. There's nobody checking me out, none of that stuff. <laughs> And I'm too old to check them out. So what's the difference, you know? The only one I have energy for is I check her out. And that's about as far as it goes. And I'm in love with her and she's in love with me. But she stopped. She said, you know, you're really handsome. One of the things that attracted me to Debbie is that she thought my father was handsome. My father, when she met my father, was probably around my age or so. And uh, he was bald-headed. And uh, she said, he's a handsome old man. And I thought to myself, if she thinks he's handsome, when I get older, she's going to really think I'm handsome. <laughs> and, and you know what? She, she never stopped like that in a long time since we were kids and said, man, you are really a handsome old man. And I said, well, girl, you're a pretty pr good looking chick yourself. <laughs> For you young people, that's a word we use, chick. It's what it was in our day, chicks, you know? So anyway, whatever. The words just ignited me on the inside. It just made me feel so good. That day was a great day. I almost wanted to stop her and say, could you stop your sentence and say that again to me? <laughs> you know, because we all need to hear stuff like that. How many days go by before these people, or even you, or the one that's sitting down the seat from you, or across from you, have heard those words, you look really good today. Blessings are on your side. God's going to bless you today because you, man, you are really wonderful. You're a king's kid. Wow, this is going to, you are precious, full of value. Did you know some people very seldom ever hear that? We need to speak those things over our spouses, over our friends, people sitting around us, and not be afraid to do it because it's deep water. It'll wash them and cleanse them. In Proverbs 20, the 12th chapter, verse number 25. I don't think I read that to you. Did I read it to you? Yes. I probably did. Anxiety is in the heart. And so guess what? A good word, word of God comes along. Let's go out of the Old Testament. Let's go into the New Testament. Here we find Timothy. He's going to pastor in a church at Ephesus. It's not an easy <clears throat> chore. This church is giant. It's got all kinds of situations and problems in it. Young Timothy is going to go pastor. And as we read out of 1 Timothy, I want you to go to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter with me. As we read out of 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, Paul, who writes to him, who is his spiritual dad, starts to give him some insight in what to do and how to live life. Really kind of cool if you really want to read 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. They're really books that will help you um, on how the church ought to be and how the church ought to act. I know some people say we don't have to do anything. It's the grace of God. I don't disagree with that. But I'll tell you what, I'd like to know why God wrote so much about what we do with our lifestyle. Then, and you can't ignore that. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And it's wonderful if you'll read it with me. In verse number 12 and verse number 13, he's telling young Timothy what to do. In verse number 12, he says, let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, 
first of all, he, when you're an example to the believers in word, it's let them see what you are by your mouth. That's what that's really saying. Let them see what you are <clears throat> by your mouth. Example, he goes on, he says to these words, example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And then he goes on, if you will, in verse number 13, until, oh, I'm, I'm in the wrong one. Am I in the right verse? Yes, I am. In verse number 13, until I come, give an attention to reading and to exhortation, to doctrine, teaching. Notice one of the things he talks about, exhortation, lifting up other people. Stop and think about it for just a moment with me. Just for a moment. Jesus, you can't find a place where he is discouraging people where they're at. You cannot find a place that says that you're a dumbbell. I mean, he does get mad at the Pharisees. He get mad at people who break the law. He got mad at people who were unrighteous and hurt people. That's true, but he did not sin. But for everybody else, everything that the Old Testament, New Testament says, really, if you gather it all together, is the greatest exhortation that there is on the planet. This is the most positive book you will ever read. Because you find out who you really are and what God really has for you. And when you find out who you really are, what God has for you, man, it changes the whole world. So here's young Timothy, he says, to exhortation. In other words, get in there, tell people how great they are. And even if they don't feel great, even if they don't think they're great, can I just say something? You're not lying. God sees them as great. Yeah. Is that cool? And in fact, in 1 uh, Timothy, let's take a look at it also in verse number 15, just jump ahead. It says, meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them. So here he comes along and says, it's really important that you do this. I thought it was fascinating, not only in 1 Timothy, but in 2 Timothy. It says in this, in verse, chapter number 4, once again, verse number 1 and verse number 2. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at the appearance of his kingdom. Preach the word, verse number 2. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and what's that word? We don't talk about it very much in American churches. Exhorting means this. I grab a hold of you or I look at you and I talk to you and I say to you, man, I want you to know you're blessed. You look blessed. God loves you. There's a future ahead of you. You know those people come in and, and I tell them, hey, precious, I want you to know today you're getting blessed and there's a future. God has a great future for her. Now they're looking back and say, yes, I'm blessed. It's a most amazing thing from absolute down and discouragement and as they grow I'm growing. As they're getting spiritually healed, I'm getting physically healed. And the more you exhort, exhortation, the more you will get free in where you're at. Sometimes we so hold back in who we are and what God's called us to do that we forget how important it is all through the scripture that God makes this statement to us. Second Timothy, amazing. But there's this little verses, one or two of them, if you will, in Titus. Titus had this incredible, he's a young pastor going to straighten out problems in the church. And here we find that Paul writes to Titus. And as he writes to Titus, he's telling him, here's what I want the church to do. In verse number nine of the first chapter, he makes this statement. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able, be sound doctrine, both to exhort, both to exhort, both to exhort and convict those who are contrite. In other words, the church is a mess. You've got a hard job. Hold fast to the word of God. Make sure that you're going to put people in place that are going to do two things. You're going to hold fast to the word of God. And listen to this, convict through the word of God. But the, notice the word, exhort, once again. In other words, it's not just about getting exhorted. It's not just about somebody else lifting me up. I got lifted up when I started lifting up others. That's my point tonight. I got healed. I got strong. I got, when I got out of myself and got into somebody else, all of a sudden, in my effort of getting out of myself and getting into somebody else, all of a sudden, not only did they get strong, I got strong. 
And that's so important for all of us to see. That's why this is over and over and over again. We ought to be the instruments of God that exhort those people that are broken down, out, and frustrated. Go to the next verse in Titus that we have up there. In Titus, if you'll take a look at it with me. In Titus, the second chapter, verse 15, says these words. The second chapter, verse, speak these things. Exhort, I guess they don't have it, rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. So the second chapter, verse 15 of Titus, second chapter, this twice in two chapters, the word exhort comes out. All I'm saying is it's wonderful to speak blessings to God. It's wonderful to speak blessings about who you are. But it's better oftentimes to speak the blessings to somebody else. You really look great today. You really are blessed today. Do you know that God sees you and knows you right where you're at? It's going to be a great job. Now, wait a minute. Most people in here are too shy to do that. My problem with that is so was I. My problem with that was, you know, I don't really want to tell people I don't know how are you today and I love you you look great today this is a day for the Lord and God's going to bless you and I love you thanks so much for coming you honor us for coming we want to bless you today I didn't want to do that I just wanted to stay home be left alone but as I gave out exhortation I got from God exhortation what you give out you get What you sow, you reap. Too many of us in this room want something from God and we're afraid to give it out. We're not the instruments God wants us to be. Until we get to the place where we can exhort those people. This morning I found myself at the back door all three services. And I loved being at the back door. I I don't preach like Pastor Dan. I don't preach like Luke anymore. But I, I tell you what, I can do good in the body of Christ. I can be there at that back door, grab your hand, and tell you I love you. This is a great day. Thanks so much for coming to church. You're, you're going to get blessed today. Next person, the same thing. Love you, bud. Thanks for coming. It's going to be a great day today. It's, what's so hard about that? Do I look like a fool? Maybe to some people. Go ahead and let me look like a fool. I'm getting results. And you can see it over and over again in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. What did Moses do? He exhorted those people. What did Peter, Paul, James, and John do? Exhort the people. What did David do but exhort his people? God, you'll find in the life of David, when he stopped communicating with God, he went down. But then he had to encourage himself. What was he doing? Exhorting himself in the Lord to lift himself up. Tonight, what you do to others is what's going to happen to you. What you speak to others is what's going to be spoken about you from God. And all of a sudden, I started feeling precious. I started feeling wanted. I started feeling loved. All of a sudden, the smile that was on my face that was there because God told me to do it was no longer there because God told me to put a smile on my face. The smile, I found myself a few weeks ago with a real smile. I was excited about seeing them come. Here they come out of that parking lot, the back parking lot, and they come strolling out, and they're slow and broken down, and I could see them, and I'm waving at them. They stop, they lift up their head, they wave back at me with a smile. I'm telling you, people, exhortation is one of the neatest things that God would have us do, and we're a bunch of people that have the ability to be used by God as an instrument to lift others up, and when we do, we get lifted up. So important for all of us. I see it now more than ever before. I'm hoping you do too. Let's make the change. It's not easy to make a compliment to somebody you don't know. Practice it. Start to say it. Because I'm telling you, what you give out is what you're going to get. And if you give out the blessings, you'll start receiving the blessings. But don't expect to receive the blessings if you can't give it away. Because they oftentimes need to hear the blessing, not just see it before they get it. Is anybody listening? Well, I'm finished. (laughs) You know, the Bible makes it very clear. He says, if you confess with your mouth, with your mouth 
how much we don't do with our mouth. You, did you know you can't even get saved unless you're going to have a mouth? That's what it says. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe not just with our mouth, but with our heart. Did you know you can't get saved unless you're speaking it out of your mouth and believing it in your heart? Believing what? Watch this. <clears throat> that God has raised him from the dead, you have, will be saved. Sometimes we go that far with this and we think that's all we have to do because that's what the Bible says. The next verse is really fascinating. A lot of people don't realize what the next verse says. The next verse says there's a relationship with your heart in believing him and shows the depth of what you really believe. So a lot of people in America that go to American churches believe with their head and even believe with their mouth. They speak it out of their mouth. They believe with their head. If they're Christians, someone told them they're Christians, said they're not Buddhist and they're not Muslims or born in America, they're Christians. Parents took them to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. They really think they're saved. But this next part of this verse, which is the next verse, is really fascinating. I, I don't know if you've ever heard it or not like this, but let me share it with you. Verse number 10, for with a heart one believes. Then it says two words. How deep does it believe? Watch this. With a heart one believes, <clears throat> and then it says two words, unto righteousness. In other words, I believe so much that I'm willing to live in righteousness. The righteousness isn't about God. In other words, I believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead the only begotten Son of God, I confess it with my mouth. My heart is a witness, but my heart has to have witness unto righteousness. It's like living the right way. When a lot of people don't see that, they think they just confess with your head and you know have a mental attitude towards God, but this is really a heart relationship with God. To the depth that you're willing to get out of yourself and the way you used to live, and start living unto righteousness. And you, and you can't live that way until you learn. Is that true? I mean, how, how can you live that way if you haven't learned how to live that way? That's why you come to church and you learn about things. Like tonight, you learned about exhortation, what, how important it is. You learned about giving and getting. You learned about speaking out of your mouth the words. And here we are, a church. And oftentimes, there's people in the audience that are here, and you've never really... And we say it like this, given God all of your heart and all of your life. You've cried out, Jesus is Lord, my Lord. But you're not willing to change to his ways, which is righteousness. Does it work? I don't know, I'm not your judge. I wouldn't try to presume whether it works or not. I'm not God. But I don't know, I would really want to examine my heart, make sure that my belief system is willing to change who I am for him. I, I, in other words, I live in a world full of dirt and filth and garbage, but I'm willing to say, God, you're my Lord and Savior. Change me to righteousness. I really want that. More than anything, I want that. And so we get people to speak it with their mouth, and we get people to feel something in the inside. But I wonder if the feeling on the inside is to, unto righteousness. Like I say, I'm not the judge nor my God. I don't know. But I wouldn't want to miss that. Some of you in here tonight have had head knowledge about who God is. No doubt about it. You're not against God. But you know you're not wholehearted for God. We need to make some changes for you. You need to make some changes. We need to help you to make those changes. You see, there's a blessing waiting for you. There's a life ahead of you. There's a promised land God wants to take you to. And it just might be that you haven't really believed in your heart on to change his way. But you have believed in your heart that he's God, but you haven't believed in your heart that you're willing to say he's God, change me.
that's unto righteousness. Why not tonight? Here's this safe and friendly place. We've laughed and we've clapped and we've sung. Most of you were already on your knees before God tonight in this house. But how about the God, here I am, surrendering my heart, giving you all my heart. Now, Jesus says it like this to a guy named Nicodemus, John 3rd chapter. He says, you must be born again. And that's really what born again means. It means I've confessed with my mouth believed with my heart, but I didn't just believe with my heart on a superficial level. I believed unto righteousness. In other words, God, here's my life. Take me and lead me somewhere. Here I am, God. Take me and change me. That, that's quite an attitude. And for a lot of us that are in here, we need to be a people that are smart enough to realize this is real tonight. And some of you need to really stop messing with God and giving God a little bit and start giving God a whole lot. One thing about the Rock Church World Outreach Center, we're not going to get away from this. I mean, if you're going to come to church here, we're going to get in your face because we love you enough to get in your face. Not only with the good, not only that you're blessed, not only that you're prosperous, not only God has a promised land for you, not only that you're a child of God, not only that God wants to bless you, tomorrow's better than today. Wow, that's great. Also, we're going to make sure you're right with God. And put the pressure on you if we have to. So you examine yourself for the unto righteousness part is just as important as confessing with your mouth or believing with your heart. Isn't it? It's what it says. And many people stop with confessing with their mouth, believing with their heart, but won't do the unto righteousness. Tonight, some of you need to get right with God and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's being born, really born again. I, I like what Mr. Pacquiao said at, on TBN. He said exactly the same thing as I interviewed him. He says, I call myself a real Christian because I'm ready with my heart to obey, to change. Whew, that was a powerful statement from a man who got saved. That's the way it should be for all of us. Some of you haven't yet gotten there yet, but tonight's your night of salvation. True, deep, meaningful salvation. And I can't make you do it, but I know you're there and you need to get right with God. And I would like you to do something. Why not do it God's way? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. So I'll count to three, I'll go like this. One, two, three, I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. And what you're saying, just right there, your hand goes up and what you're saying is I want you to pray for me, Pastor. And I want you to help me get right with God. And I'll do that, that's what I'm here for. And you're hearing my voice right now. And then the blessings that we talked about, the position that we talked about, the, the exhortation is yours because you're a king's kid now. But if you choose not to raise your hand because you're embarrassed, please, isn't it being embarrassed for a moment better than being in hell forever and ever because you won't make that extra step to Jesus? Tonight all across this auditorium. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Who should raise your hand if you're a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, token prayer, one of those kind of people that you're not against God, but you're really not wholehearted for God, and you know who you are, then get your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're saying, I need Jesus, I really want him to change me to righteousness. I have spoken it with my mouth, believed it, I thought with my heart, but I haven't really believed to that depth because I keep doing my own thing. Good, good clue. Let's, let's get right with God. All across the auditorium, we won't embarrass you. All you have to do is put your hand up. In fact, I'm going to have every head bowed and every eye closed right now. We're just going to do this on an unusual way here at the Rock Church. We don't often do this. Come on, close your eyes. Bow your heads. I'm going to count to three, everybody. Nobody's looking around. This is between you and God right now. I want to see your hand go up. And put it right back down if that's you. Nobody looking, no neighbor, no behind you, nobody. Everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed. It's very unusual for us to do it like this, but tonight I'm doing it for you. Because tonight, if I didn't do this, you'd miss it. You wouldn't do it. But now there's no excuse. 
all across this auditorium. If you know you need to give God all of your heart, you've been holding back, let's get right with God. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand together. You put your hand up all across this auditorium. Nobody lift your head. Nobody clap. Keep your head down, your eyes closed. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two, three, four, five. Thank you. There's six. Thank you. There's seven. Thank you. Back over here. There's eight. Thank you. God bless you. There's nine back here. There's ten back over here. Thank you. God bless you. There's eleven. Thank you. I got that. Twelve back here. Thank you. Everybody's head bowed. Everybody's eyes closed. Thank you. There's 13. Thank you. There's 14. Thank you. There's 14 of you. Go ahead and put your hands down. Now everybody lift your head and look at me. Now Jesus got beat up for you. Back was broken open. Blood all over the place. People along the sides of the streets of Jerusalem spitting at him and yelling at him and screaming at him. I want to ask all 14 of you that raised your hands. If Jesus can walk the streets, a beaten, bloody mess for you, could you walk a safe aisle for Jesus? When you get up out of your seat, I'm talking to the 14 of you that raised your hands, and anybody that should have but didn't, you know who you are. I'm asking you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, even if you're sitting next to it, say, friend, please go with me. I want you to get in the aisle. I want you to meet me here in front. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But I want you to know something. If you can't even get out of your seat and get in the aisle and meet me in front, you will never live for Jesus unto righteousness. Because out there in the world, it's going to be a tough thing for you. And in this safe and friendly place, you can come. Out of the family rooms, you can bring your children, bring your stuff. Just get your stuff together and come if you need to. Wherever you're at. I want everybody to stand, and every one of you that raised your hand, come meet me right here in front. Come on, let's have some courage, and you come right now. We're waiting for you. You come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just as you. The Spirit calls, come just as you are. Come on. Come and see. <laughs> hey, I love you, and I think you're beautiful, and I think you're beautiful, and I love you, precious, and I think I know you are beautiful and be- wonderful. Look at you, handsome. You look so good. I'm so happy to see you, my brother. It's wonderful. Hello, beautiful. We love you. God sees you as beautiful and valuable, and I thank you for coming. God's going to bless you. We want you to know that you are gorgeous, and we're in love with you, and we're going to bless you, and your future is going to be greater than you can imagine. Love you, my handsome friend. You're great, and God wants to bless you in every area of your life. The future is going to be great. Hello, handsome. God's going to be doing great things in your life. You're a great man of God. Great man of God. Hello, beautiful. I want you to know something. God loves you, and you're beautiful from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. God's going to bless you today and bless you forever. You keep chasing him. There's a new awakening, a new life waiting for you that's going to be great. Oh, I know you're (laughs) handsome anyway. God bless you. We love you. I want you to know how wonderful you are. You're precious. God bless you. Thank you for coming. You're absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And I love you so much. I love you, precious. God bless you. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Ooh, you're precious and love you. Hello, precious. God bless you. You are so wonderful. God's going to do great things in your life, a great future ahead of you. Hello, my friends. God bless you. Love you both. You are wonderful and precious. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. It's going to be exciting. The future ahead of you. Mm. It's going to be, because God's there, he's going to take care of you. Isn't God good? Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's go before the Lord. Say these words out loud. Say, Father God. God. Now everybody say, Father God. God. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for me. I believe You're the only begotten son. I believe your blood 
washes away my sins. I repent. I turn from evil unto your righteousness with all of my heart and with all of my life. I give you the rest of my life. I give you all of my heart. I give you all of my life. I am from this day forward born again. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I've got blood right, blood bought rights. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved, headed for heaven, not going to hell. I've got the victory. My past is forgotten and forgiven. I've got the King of Kings on the inside of me. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Hey, you don't have to pray for them, you know, but you do got to give them some stuff. Hey, this is my friend, Joel. He's going to give you some free stuff. Take it home. I wrote a book for you. Oh, it's a big, thick book. Nah, it's like two pages long, three pages about what to do next. It's really simple. Joel, he'll help you. Just make a left turn. Follow Joel right over there and love you guys so much. You're the best, 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 best. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Precious, precious, thank you, thank you. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.